and get us started and my introductory remarks are um, a, a long enough to give to give other people a chance to to join uh, as I'm making the introduction so I would just like to welcome everyone uh, good afternoon uh, and welcome to the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council uh, and our program today with guest speaker Ben Delgado thanks to Ben and everyone who's joined us online today my name is Ty Swinkelblack. I'm a member of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council Board and uh, chair of its fundraising committee and today's host. We would like to acknowledge and thank our annual donors, sponsors, and partners for their support. The Iowa Arts Council through the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, Humanities Iowa and the National Endowment for the Humanities, the University of Iowa's International Programs, Honors Program, Public Policy Center, and Center for Human Rights, the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, Midwest One Bank, City Channel 4 uh, for providing online access to every single uh, ICFRC program along with the UI Library Archives. We would also like to thank a special sponsor of today's program, Hazel Seba, who's a longtime member and supporter of the ICFRC. Hazel, we thank you so much for your wonderful support. As we get started, I would like to cover a couple of Zoom etiquette tips. Uh, even though many of us uh, feel like this is somewhat old hat, we can always learn, learn new things and remember uh, every single uh, Zoom meeting is slightly different. Uh, so uh, I think we've been able to mute everybody today. And so that's a new trick we learned to make it easier for you not to worry about uh, whether or not you're accidentally speaking during Ben's presentation. Um, but we'd also just say our, our usual um, protocol is for you to turn off your video during the speaker's remarks. He'll have a presentation today. Um, and then around 1245, uh, when we go to our uh, question and answer session. Um, I think it's nice for our speaker to be able to see you. And so if you wouldn't mind, if you can remember, remind, uh, I'll try to remind you to turn back on your video feeds and you can enter your uh, questions in the chat function um, and we'll um, keep your uh, audio muted just uh, to make it a little easier to get through the Q&A. So thank you, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce Ben Delgado, who will speak about the universal appeal of foreign film, a journey through Latin America's cinema and beyond. Ben Delgado is the programming director at Film Scene, Iowa City's premier art house theater. He holds a master's degree from The Ohio State University in Arts Policy and a BA in Communication and Culture from Indiana University. Mr. Delgado began his programming career at Coral Gables Art Cinema in 2013, where he helped to develop artist services programs to aid local filmmakers. And he curated a diverse film selection featuring award-winning filmmakers in person for question and answers uh, sessions and workshops. In 2017, he joined the programming team of the American Film Institute's Silver Theater and Cultural Center, playing an integral role in presenting over 800 annual offerings with film festivals, repertory, and first-run films. While at the AFI Silver, he also co-founded and co-hosted the Silver Streams podcast. In his current role at Film Scene, Mr. Delgado has overseen the return of several beloved programs alongside special events, repertory offerings, new films, filmmaker guests, and more. In his talk today, Mr. Delgado will draw from his years of experience in film programming, including one of the longest running and largest Latin American film festivals in the country. Um, if you're a film lover like I am, uh, then I know you will join me in welcoming and celebrating uh, a presentation today. 
by our guest, Ben Delgado. Ben, over to you. Thank you so much for uh, that great introduction, Tice, and thank you to the Iowa Foreign, Iowa City Foreign Relations Council for, for having me today. And um, a special shout out to Karen Chapel, who uh, has been a longtime supporter of Film Scene since the very beginning and who thought of me for this presentation. Uh, and to Catherine as well, um, and everyone who joined us today. This is uh, exciting. I see a lot of names. Um, I'm sure a lot of film scene fans, and um, the, the Mr. Delgado stuff was a little formal, a little strange, but I'm Ben. I am the programming director of Film Scene, as Tice mentioned, um, and I'm going to kick it off with a presentation. I have a, a visual aid here, so I'm going to share my screen uh, so we can get started. All right, I believe the screen is sharing. Um, so this this picture uh, I chose for a couple reasons. And, and today we're gonna talk about, as Tice mentioned, uh, uh, the universal appeal of foreign film, how foreign cinema, international films uh, appeal to everyone and can appeal to anyone regardless of culture um, and also just transport you to different cultures. And speaking of culture, um, I chose this picture of myself to start off. Um, number one, I think it's obvious because it's, it's a really cute picture. I think it's, it's safe to say. Um, but number two, it really um, it emphasizes what my parents uh, wanted to instill in me, which was a love of my cultural heritage, my background, where I came from. Both my parents were born in Mexico and moved here to the United States when they were fairly young. Uh, but they always uh, instilled in me a love of my culture and uh, of, of my people, um, even and especially the language. So at home, I couldn't even speak uh, English. I was uh, I was forced to speak Spanish and kind of hated it as a kid, honestly. But um, I'm super super thankful, obviously, now that that I uh, am able to speak both Spanish and English. So, um, but that factors into um, the films I watched and, and the film that I consumed as a kid and how I was able to see myself or not on screen. So growing up, the films that I watched were very much American movies, right? They were American cinema. It was what was playing at the local multiplex. I remember, for example, uh, Jurassic Park you see here uh, was the first film I ever saw in a movie theater. I remember picking it out from the newspaper, getting the showtime, um, and going to see it and being terrified. Um, and Clueless uh, is another one of my favorites uh, that I included here um, because it's a film I watched countless times um, as a kid uh, after getting an uh, injury from sledding. I remember staying home from school and for whatever reason, picking this one out at the video store and just watching it over and over again. Mm -hmm. And of course we have the, the various Disney films, The Lion King, Aladdin, The Great Mouse Detective. These are just a few of the films that I saw as a kid and that I saw myself in. So in the same way that international film has universal appeal and you can see yourself in them, I saw myself in these films that were uh, chiefly American films and I saw myself as Cher, Alicia Silverstone in uh, Clueless. I saw myself as Aladdin from Aladdin. Uh, I very much saw myself as Aladdin, even though I really wasn't in Aladdin. Uh, or Basil from The Great Mouse Detective. It's any number of things. I think it's a, a, a very uh, easy thing to forget that you can just naturally put yourself in someone else's shoes. Um, and it's something that I was doing subconsciously because obviously at that age, um, no one is really thinking explicitly, at least I wasn't, of it, you know, five, six, seven, eight. Um, why don't I see myself on screen? But as time went on, I did start to kind of see myself on screen and realize that there were depictions of my culture or the language that I was speaking uh, in films that I was watching. So uh, the first image here is uh, The Three Caballeros, which has its own problems uh, in retrospect. Obviously it's from the forties. Um, there's certain uh, presentations or representations that aren't exactly the best, but it was an early example for me of 
my culture seen on screen, at least in part, since this is kind of a journey through Latin America. I don't know if uh, anyone out there is familiar with this film, um, but it's also a technological feat in that it, I believe it was the first film to have uh, animation live action, the first feature film, or one of the first. Uh, Snow White. Mm, that's not right. Anyway, one of the first, an early one, an early example of that. Um, and then on the right, there's a, a couple stalwarts, uh, legends of Mexican comedy. Um, we have La India Maria, who was a favorite of, of both my parents. And of course, uh, down in the bottom right corner is Cantinflas, who is heralded as the Mexican uh, Charlie Chaplin. So those two were, of course, explicit representations in media of Mexico, of Mexican culture, Mexican heritage, and La India Maria specifically of a culture within a culture uh, representing the native population, the uh, native Indian population, Native American population, uh, specifically the lower class. Um, again, none of these representations are perfect. It's really difficult for that to happen, but they were influential in shaping uh, who I was and how I saw film. And the last thing here, which is probably the most obscure, strange thing to have in here is John Travolta holding a dog with wings mm -hmm. from the film Michael, uh, directed by Nora Ephron, which was my introduction, believe it or not, to the language of Portuguese. Um, so Michael in the film is an angel. And one of the things he has is the ability to, I guess, speak any language. And in one of the scenes, he's speaking Portuguese uh, to someone who um, is in need of medical attention. He's interpreting for them. And I had never heard Portuguese before. And I was straining to understand what he was saying and thinking to myself, is John Travolta trying to speak Spanish, but actually drunk? That, that was my interpretation of how the, the language that he was speaking came out to my ear. Um, and so that's how I was seeing uh, that film. And weirdly enough, kind of Nora Ephron's film expanded into uh, other cultures for me, uh, in his case, in the language of Portuguese. But international film, uh, foreign film could be anything, right? I mean, there's so many different uh, films, so many different types, and you can see them anywhere. It's uh, films cross borders and in this case, the films I have here are films that I saw all in Mexico. Uh, while visiting my family down in Mexico, I'd go every other year for Christmas and um, Life is Beautiful and Cinema Paradiso, the two Italian films here, um, are films I saw in Italian dubbed in Spanish. Um, uh, you wanna talk about different cultures coming together, Italian, Spanish, of course the languages are similar, but they aren't exactly the same. And um, at a young age, when I'm watching these films, I'm not exactly catching all the subtitles and reading them quickly enough in Spanish uh, to understand what's happening. But nevertheless, I was able to process what was going on in the films. It helps that I spoke Spanish and is so similar to Italian, um, but it speaks to the universality of film. And then Itumama Tambien, uh, we've got Garcia Bernal, Diego Luna from uh, Alfonso Cuaron uh, was a film that we snuck um, in in our repertoire in, in Mexico. So my cousins, my sister and I just watched that one when we shouldn't have been watching it, but uh, a very Mexican film and uh, watched it very early on in its release. Uh, all of these films um, also um, were not exactly legal copies. I believe they were all uh, purchased at various markets uh, in the small town where my grandparents lived, which uh, up until maybe my teenage years only had one phone in the whole city itself. So um, you can, can see that these films probably weren't in the best condition, uh, but they made it to that little small town in Mexico. Uh, by the time I got to high school, uh, this love of film was really blossoming that I had. And um, it, I think was, spirited by uh, the three amigos, those tres amigos, um, Alfonso Coron, who was on the previous slide, uh, and también, uh, Alejandro González Iñárritu, and Amores Perros, um, and, the, <clears throat> excuse me, and 
del Toro, uh, Guillermo del Toro for Pan's Labyrinth. Those are, those are the films uh, that really kind of kicked it off in terms of seeing representation behind the camera as well as in front of the camera. Uh, at this point, they're all Oscar winning filmmakers. They have all won Oscars for their work. Um, at the time they were up and coming, um, but they penetrated the popular culture in a way that gave opportunities to other filmmakers. And beyond those Mexican films, I was also seeing films from other uh, Latin American countries or Spanish speaking countries. Um, Spain being, of course, a Spanish speaking country. Um, uh, Pedro Almodovar was very big in, in the formation of uh, Latin American cinema, but not Latin American cinema, apologies, uh, Spanish language cinema. Um, in this case, All About My Mother, a film here is the first that I saw of his and one that was nominated for an Oscar. Um, and Gael Garcia Bernal, again, making an appearance. I think I was a fan at the time and I still am uh, for Motorcycle Diaries. Uh, this is an interesting case in which we have a Brazilian filmmaker telling a story of a historical figure, an Argentinian figure, and being played by a Mexican actor. So this is kind of the ultimate example of uh, a film that uh, sees, doesn't see borders. It, it's a universal presentation of, uh, of a story and it actually introduced me to accents within Spanish, right? So I, I had different accents uh, within the country of Mexico uh, with the Spanish that is spoken especially between rural and city. But then there's also, of course, different accents within uh, different countries. So uh, Gael is very good at accents. He's very good at um, accents in Spanish. And so his Argentinian accent is, is excellent here. And it's a great movie, Motorcycle Diaries. So by the time I left uh, high school, got into um, college, I thought, let's see more stories of myself on screen. Let's actually start putting into practice uh, what I'm seeing a lack of in film and decided I was going to be a filmmaker. That didn't last. That didn't work. Um, but I discovered programming and uh, that led me down the path of uh, ending up in Iowa City. Uh, but before that, there's a lot to cover in terms of how programming um, affects borders and how programming affects representation uh, in film. So this is this is actually me in graduate school, um, not in undergrad, but close enough. Um, lots to get into there, but I'll leave that for another day and we'll jump into a professional life that uh, really exemplifies how all these things come together to present these different films. So the first job I had, as Tice mentioned in the introduction, was at the Coral Gables Art Cinema, which is in Miami. And before I even got the job, before I even officially started, it was a trial of about three days uh, working there. And the very first thing that I did was go to a hotel in Coral Gables and pick up a suitcase looking thing uh, from a Uruguayan filmmaker who was staying at a hotel nearby and bring it to the cinema. That suitcase looking thing was a hard drive um, within the suitcase. And that was the film. That was the film Anina, which you see a picture up here in, in the Miami International Children's Film Festival. So uh, it being Miami, the first language anyone speaks to you is Spanish, very common. Uh, and the festival being an international children's film festival in Miami, uh, it stands to reason that we would have Spanish language cinema there. Uh, so this was a Spanish language film uh, for kids, a very charming movie and an introduction for me to the festival world. Um, and the festival world is really where these films flourish, where international films flourish within the United States. Um, here you see also the badge for Sundance, the Sundance Film Festival, one of the biggest festivals in the world, not especially concentrated on international or foreign films, although they do have sections. Um, but for me, that was the introduction I had to what a real festival is. 
the Miami International Children's Film Festival is a festival, of course, but it's a satellite festival, it's a smaller festival, and is much more regional and local. Um, when you start to look at the macro scale, bigger film festivals, uh, Sundance is obviously one of the top ones. So part of festivals and part of programming is travel, filmmaker travel, and actor travel, director travel, producer, screenwriter, anyone involved in film has to travel and cross borders uh, to come to your films when they can. Uh, of course, sometimes it's difficult. In all these cases here, you see uh, Javier Camara, who we saw earlier in the talk to her still uh, on the far left. And you don't see her face, but Geraldine Chaplin is signing her poster here for Cria Cuervos. Uh, this is a film she made while she was uh, still with director Carlos Saura. And she maintains a home in Miami, that's why she was there. Uh, and on the far right, we have Brazilian actress, uh, the legendary uh, Brazilian, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, <laughs> the legendary Brazilian actress, Sonny Braga, uh, from her film Aquarius. So these are all various scenarios um, that happened while living in Miami um, with Javier Camara. He was there for a film, Living is Easy with Eyes Closed. Uh, partially, his trip was partially funded by a, the Spanish embassy, but also by uh, an airline. Uh, Sonia Braga, on the other hand, was there for a tour. She was touring the United States and the distributor had put on this tour of the film. So the US distributor um, paid for her travel throughout the country to promote the film and did very well. Um, an excellent movie uh, if you haven't seen that one. So there's guests, there's international travel plans, there's difficulty, and sometimes you're doing full series, full on series of filmmakers. Um, and that can be a, more an issue of rights. So these are pictures from a series we did with Juan Astueva, a young filmmaker who just recently, a few days ago, won a Goya award for best documentary for his latest film. Uh, this was in 2016, so it's been a few years since uh, this series happened, but it was a full retrospective of his work, of Jonas Tueva's work. Um, Jonas is also the son of Fernando Tueva, uh, who some of you may know as the Oscar-winning director of the film Belle Epoque. Um, so he's uh, definitely got some pedigree, but his films, like all films, tend to bounce around in terms of who has the licensing rights, who has the uh, rights to screen the film. So this is where when you're doing a full retrospective of a filmmaker, you have to go to different rights holders in different countries and uh, negotiate terms. And in this case, um, we played a film, his first film that we had to get film prints of. So 35 millimeter prints, this is how they used to show them, not on hard drives. Uh, we got a film print of uh, through the Spanish uh, Cultural Embassy, Cultural Institute, the, uh, the wing of the embassy, uh, through the cultural purse. And these prints come in bags, interestingly enough, in, in burlap sacks, um, which turned out fine, but uh, an interesting case of how film gets to, uh, to and from where it's going. Um, you see here, there's also added um, talent in terms of the presentation, uh, the woman playing guitar uh, is a singer that who goes by Tulsa. And she did the music for the film Romantic Exiles, which was his latest film at the time. And was she was playing music over the credits as the credits went up. Um, and then because Juanas is an independent filmmaker, uh, he has to maintain a day job. Um, independent film doesn't exactly pay for all the bills, at least not for him yet in Spain. So he's a, a teacher, a film teacher during the day. And so he's doing a workshop and he's uh, very uh, used to doing that in his presentation. If you squint really hard, you can kind of see him sitting. This is from the booth from above, um, just some of exper his experimental work on the screen there. So this, this is Javier Bardem, but it was me, this is my face. Uh, we talked about those cultural purses and the 35 millimeter prints. Uh, sometimes those prints uh, can be an issue. Sometimes films can not make it to their destination. They're held up in customs. 
their the wrong film there are any number of things so this is from the film before night falls uh, a film that screened at the coral gables art cinema and it was from director julian schnabel a um, well-known director uh, and it was his personal print it was his personal print we thought it was going to be excellent it's going to be a pristine 35 millimeter presentation uh, and the print got there just a little close to showtime so let's say two or three days before um, the film was supposed to screen and it turns out that the subtitles were in spanish for this particular film <laughs> and although we're in miami and spanish is the first language we have dedicated fans who are coming and don't speak spanish and of course we need to be accommodating for everyone um, and here in the united states when you're showing film if you don't have english language subtitles you're excluding a majority of your audience in most cases uh, of course, for films that aren't in English. Uh, so after some searching, there was an overnight Amazon DVD that happened. Uh, the presentation went okay, but it, these are these kinds of things that you don't think about uh, from the outside in, but when you're actually doing it, uh, all, all kinds of things can come up um, in print traffic. Uh, so from here, uh, we'll jump just to um, as Tice mentioned, 2017, going to the American Film Institute in Washington, D.C., a truly global city, uh, the U.S. capital. And this is uh, the big historic theater there at the AFI Silver Theater. And it seats 400 seats. As was mentioned in the introduction, there's over 800 films programmed a year. That's Frankly, it's excessive, but it's um, it makes sense for the community in which you have such a multicultural representation of people and um, we get into the various festivals and in particular Latin American Film Festival, but the various festivals that AFI put on. Um, so when I first started, uh, the one of the very first things I did was go to the Capital Irish Film Festival. So it's an Irish film festival, specifically a country specific film festival. And that's uh, still from the Young Offenders there, the two, the two guys in their, in their underwear, I think they're about to jump into a body of water. Um, that film had the, one of the lead actresses uh, in attendance and uh, a longstanding festival with an Irish community. So the Irish community came out for that. And it's since been turned into a television series, that film. And then Kati Kati is a film in the New African Film Festival, which has been around for, I think this is the 17th year this year. So it would have been uh, 11th or 12th edition uh, when I was there, when I was starting. And again, both of these are just a representation of how varied international film can be. Uh, Kati Kati being a, a ghost story and uh, young Offenders, this comedy, a buddy comedy with uh, two kids running off, uh, running away from home. Getting into some of the issues I know that the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council has been discussing, specifically cinema of migration here, um, that there's a storied history uh, with crossing borders in film and representing that on film. And Funnily enough, one of the very first meetings I took in DC was with a group of people of embassies and cultural institutes um, for a series that ended up being called Films Across Borders. So the topic here was stories of migration. Um, the series had over 25 different films at 10 different locations. And as you can see here involved the uh, American University, French Embassy, the DC Labor Film Festival, the Goethe Institute of Washington, DC, the Immigration Film Festival, the Mexican Cultural Institute, the National Gallery of Art, and Spain Arts and Culture, which is uh, a wing of the Spanish Embassy. Uh, the films that AFI showed, An American Tale, Pele the Conqueror, La Pirogue, all very different stories of crossing borders. Um, and a good swath uh, representation of what that can be. Um, so this was also an introduction to working with uh, embassies, which is at least for pre presenting films in Washington, DC, 
in other major cities, uh, embassies are play a big role in how film is presented in terms of financing, uh, in terms of guests, and of course, in terms of reaching specific communities. And speaking of embassies, the Spanish embassy, the uh, Spain Arts and Culture, were a huge factor in um, the programming for the AFI Silver Theater. Uh, these are two stills from Spanish Cinema Now, the series that um, started the year that I started in at AFI. Uh, that was the opening film on the left with the woman with the cigarette. It's uh, Maria and the Others. And that filmmaker came out in person, Nami Jaguera, uh, to screen that film. And then Isla Bonita is uh, another film that played during that series. But it's that series is one that grew um, in specifically with a younger audience which is an interesting factor uh, that I think was due in large part to Spain arts and culture in their focus on uh, younger audiences. And of course, they had tons of funding um, to be able to bring in guests. So we always had guests for this festival. The small festival was about anywhere between six and eight films. Uh, there was always at least one guest for the films there. But now we get to the big festival, the festival that for me personally was the one I'm most proud of, but also one of the biggest and most impactful festivals that AFI does, the Latin American Film Festival. And here you see a, a few guests um, provided from different uh, countries and different embassies. So uh, the distinguished citizen that is the screenwriter of the film there, uh, doing a Q&A with him. And he was actually in town for uh, a curation, a curated uh, piece he had done for uh, a museum. So he's actually a curator in his day-to-day -day life, uh, not necessarily a screenwriter. And he that travel was paid for by the Argentinian embassy. And that film in particular, and that q and in particular, was a test of uh, my language skills. So one of the big things uh, that comes into play when you talk about international film or foreign film is, of course, language and a language barrier. Um, and sometimes that barrier comes up with filmmakers or film guests. Uh, and I often am doing interpreting on the fly for these specific Q&As. Uh, I think he fancied himself like a, a wordsmith and didn't really give any breaks for my interpreting. So that was a challenge. And that's the kind of thing that comes up uh, when presenting these, these foreign films, um, in particular Spanish films, because those are the only ones that I can uh, do the interpreting for. But, uh, you know, it's being able to present that film to the audience in its entirety. So English, Spanish speaking audience. Um, oftentimes I'm also interpreting questions uh, as well as uh, the answers that the directors or screenwriters or actors will give. Uh, Sebastian Hoffman for Timeshare, uh, that was an amazing conversation that was almost entirely not about the film, ended up being a very weirdly political conversation. Uh, but Sebastian is a great guy who uh, knows English very well, so that was no problem. But that's one of the other things that factor into presentation uh, in presenting these films in the festival context is filmmaker guests and filmmaker travel. Uh, speaking of traveling, uh, maybe one of the most impactful, if not the most impactful uh, screenings uh, that I had uh, was uh, for I Dream in Another Language from uh, Ernesto Contreras, the director you see in that first picture. Um, his travel was almost something that didn't happen. It was the year that there was the massive earthquake in Mexico City, which has happened just a few days before he was set to come here. And uh, the executive director of the Mexican Cultural Institute, she wrote a really compelling letter to uh, Ernesto and convinced him to come represent in the nation's capital, come represent uh, the film and to speak about what was happening in Mexico. Uh, we had a room full in that big auditorium. You saw that big house, a room full of people. Um, and I held a moment of silence and you could feel 
the air in the room, you can feel it change, you can feel the, uh, the weight of that moment. And those are the kinds of things that, uh, of course, impede international travel, impede uh, filmmaking and film presentation rather, but uh, they also can, can be important in uh, contextualizing how these uh, films are shown. And the group of people here from uh, Honduras who made their own way. So a lot of times um, we have embassy support, which is, as I mentioned earlier, and also in the case of Ernesto, but uh, there's also filmmakers who are just eager to travel with their film and, and talk about it with an audience. So uh, these filmmakers were able to make their own way to Washington, DC. Uh, we have the director, producer, and actor here on stage for a film called A Place in the Caribbean. And the director is now working on a uh, television series that I think has eight episodes um, completed. But that's the usually the smaller films in the smaller countries, it's difficult to um, bring out filmmakers because the budgets from the embassies just aren't there. And, a little bit of the uh, policy talk is just getting into embassies and their budgets and how that affects what films can be shown um, in the communities that exist around them. So uh, yeah, those are the films and uh, filmmakers uh, of the Latin American Film Festival. That was uh, a huge part of what I did at the AFI Silver Theater, um, including I'll just briefly get into one story um, that happened during this festival. Um, another print traffic nightmare that, uh, you know, customs can, can be a problem. So things can get held up in customs, uh, and they do. Um, in, in one case, we had a film, a hard drive, get held up in customs, and it didn't arrive in time. And so I was screen capturing Netflix. The film was actually already on Netflix um, to try to present that as opposed to the drive. And after lots of paperwork and phone calls, we finally got the drive, thankfully, because what had happened when I was screen capturing Netflix is of course the thing that always happens with Netflix. And as the credits were rolling, boom, pops up the next suggested thing. Of, uh, wouldn't you like to see this episode of Downton Abbey or whatever it suggested? So of course that wouldn't have been a terrible presentation. And those kinds of things always always come up when, when presenting films in a film festival setting. And of course, the biggest thing that comes up, the biggest thing that has come up in the past two years, uh, COVID, the reason we're doing this the way we're doing it today, um, hit us for uh, our various festivals at the AFI Silver Theater. Um, but in a weird way, there's also uh, broke down the borders that were existing uh, for a lot of filmmakers to come. It uh, made it so that budget was no longer really a factor. It was more of a scheduling issue. And uh, even before, obviously there were uh, ability to have filmmaker Q and A's via the methods we're doing right now. Uh, however, it really wasn't common practice or felt like it was, especially for filmmakers who are in countries in different time zones. For example, for a European Union film showcase, I did a Q&A with a Lithuanian filmmaker. This is his first feature, um, an amazing Q&A and an amazing film, but there was obviously not gonna be a budget to have him come out or frankly, an audience that would be able to justify bringing him out. Uh, but to be able to schedule a Q&A at 10 o'clock in the morning, record it and put it up with the film is really, it's, it's a great thing. Um, it's a great to be able to contextualize films in that way. Uh, in this case, this is of course for a Latin American Film Festival and it's Fernando Valadez, uh, who is the director, screenwriter and producer of a film called Identifying Features and her producing partner, uh, Astrid Zondero. And that Q&A was, was amazing for uh, a film that was just coming out in, in the US a few months after and came out early 2021. So COVID in a weird way has, has helped film presentation and um, international uh, guests, so to speak. And hopefully we can keep a little bit of that um, once things start to come back to normal, which who knows when that will ever happen, unfortunately. Uh, and of course, 
now we're here in Iowa City um, and I am programming for Film Scene, which is an amazing opportunity. And I'm so happy that so many Film Scene supporters are here today and know the history that Film Scene has already with foreign language and international film. So you see Minari here, which was shown outdoors, if uh, folks remember that. Um, that film is actually maybe one of the first times that I saw myself represented on screen. And it's pretty recent that I saw myself represented on screen almost directly to a T. Uh, obviously, that's not my culture. My family's from Mexico. This is not my era. This is about a decade before me. But the immigrant story, the children, the child of immigrants, I, I connected so deeply with that film. It was uh, an amazing experience. And I think that that's the kind of thing that I hope for people to experience themselves is to be able to see themselves that way on screen. It's a, an amazing movie. Uh, El Norte, uh, a film, that, a classic film that played a few years back. And then Vino Verite series, which is something that uh, is a very successful series here at Film Scene um, that is from Midnight Family, a documentary uh, that followed a family of paramedics in uh, Mexico City and had the director out for that one as well. So a swath of things that Film Scene has done in the past. But I see a very bright future for film scene and for film in general, um, and want to continue the tradition of presenting film uh, from different countries, from different perspectives here in Iowa City and at film scene. So we haven't made an official announcement and we're still very much pre-planning, but 2023, we're looking at a Latin American film festival um, here in Iowa City. Uh, this is a, from a film, Beba, that I saw at the 2021 Toronto International Film Festival. That's the director, Rebecca Hunt, who is a uh, Venezuelan Dominican uh, filmmaker living in New York, actually born in New York, but her parents are from those countries, respectively. And uh, maybe that film's included, maybe other films are included. Um, but yeah, I think the future of film is, is very bright, future film presentation and crossing the borders to, um, to see different perspectives of the world. And then hopefully we continue to do that here in Iowa City. Terrific, thank you, Ben. Uh, really appreciate your presentation. Um, and uh, I'm really interested in some of the films that you mentioned, uh, but I'm going to perform my uh, my official duties by just noting to the to the audience who's joining us today that we're going to move to the uh, question and answer portion of the program. You know the routine. You've done this before. Um, and so in the chat function, if you'd want to uh, list your um, your questions, if you want to turn your videos on, it's always, I think, more engaging for uh, the speaker if you can see people. Uh, so please if you feel comfortable, do that. Um, and I just want to just note a thank you to our members and our donors who make the ICFRC uh, able to, to, to uh, continue to present to you uh, in a variety of ways, hopefully in person and virtually again coming soon. Um, so we, we sincerely appreciate your support. Um, as always, if you if you would like to make a gift to the ICFRC uh, to support our programs, you can go to icfrc.org and uh, and click on uh, donate there. So, all right. Well, let's move over to the chat. Um, I guess uh, you know I have some questions while people get warmed up. Um, First, I was wondering, you know, there was a big controversy over the selection of, or the casting of Javier Bardem as Desi Ardez. And I just wondered what your, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Motorcycle Diaries. And so I was just curious what your point of view is about that controversy. That's an interesting controversy, and it's actually funny because uh, before Night Falls in the film that um, I mentioned in the presentation, he's actually playing a Cuban as well, uh, a Cuban writer. Um, and 
I think there's opportunities for people to play other cultures. I think that's a thing that can be done, but I see the issue when it comes to giving uh, opportunities to people who may not have them. Uh, so you know, when you have a major Spanish filmmaker or Spanish actor given the opportunity to play a role of a Cuban, it, it feels a little off. It, it doesn't feel exactly right. And then also he didn't do a great job with the accent, I thought. So that was, that was another mm-hmm. thing. I talked about the accents. I think that it actually does make a, a difference if you're able to kind of get the characterizations right. So. Good, thank you. Thank you for just giving your point of view. Um, here's somebody who's asking a question in the chat uh, saying, uh, one of one of this person's pet peeves is how foreign films are often presented to US audiences through dubbing rather than subtitles. Um, you know, this person has lived in Europe and is just commenting that that doesn't seem to be really the norm uh, when presenting uh, language, foreign language films to audiences, uh, you know, so that they really look at subtitles and can see, can hear the actors' uh, actual voices. Um, what do you think about that uh, from just an accessibility language, but also staying true to the filmmaker's intent? Yeah, so there is, uh, as you mentioned, the question of accessibility when it comes to dubbed films. Um, it's actually something that doesn't happen much here these days. Um, historically, it was something that happened more often, especially in like home video releases. Um, but nowadays, especially with DVD and things like that, there are language options you can choose at home. Um, but as far as a theatrical presentation, I, I would always prefer a subtitled presentation and would almost always, I say almost because there's a small exception, I would almost always present the film in its original language with subtitles when available. Um, but for films that are maybe for a younger audience, uh, animated films, for example, some animated films that are for a younger audience, uh, we may do both. We may have both options. Um, so we recently ran a uh, film at Film Scene called Dell, which is kind of an in-between in terms of the audience. Maybe it's older kids, um, but we did have a few screenings that were uh, the dubbed version uh, just to accommodate a younger audience who may not be able to read the subtitles fast enough. So in those cases, I make an exception. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Um, just as a side sidebar, uh, when I was a kid, my mom took me to see um, a French film called The King of Hearts, Ooh, uh, which is a, a, a great film, but also, you know, quite serious subject matter. But I, you know, apparently I, I couldn't read, uh, but I loved the movie. And so I just find it interesting that children sometimes are more able to pivot around those types of issues and still kind of understand kind of the content of a, of a film. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. And you kind of, you mentioned something somewhat similar, so. Right. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you feel the business of filmmaking is um, doing a better job or not doing a better job uh, I'm sure there's a bit of both in terms of representation. I think that you're right. There's a little bit of both. Um, because of the democratization of film equipment, I think that that has led to a lot of opportunities for people who may not have had them before. Um, so I think it's inarguable that there's more things being made by more people. Um, but in terms of the people who are getting the opportunities, if you look at, for example, the current Oscars that were just announced, uh, the nominations were announced, it was about a week ago now. Um, it's slightly diverse, but it's not exactly diverse. So I think that, that still the things that are being elevated uh, are mostly the same kind of white, cis, hetero stories, narratives. Um, but there's things slowly inching their way in. Um, for example, Drive My Car, which is currently playing at film scene. 
uh, is a three hour long Japanese film um, that happens to also be nominated for best picture overall uh, this year. And Parasite uh, recently won best picture, a uh, Korean film. So I think that we're, we're seeing small changes, but it's not really, you know, it's not a complete 180 from what, how things used to be, uh, but we're improving. Good. In terms of kind of mass consumption, uh, streaming services are now providing content that are much more diverse in terms of featuring television and film from all, you know, from a variety of countries and a variety of languages. Do you, how do you think that's having an impact? Is it having an impact in, in the way sort of your average uh, television or film consumer is um, accessing uh, a more varied content? I think it is, uh, and that's, that's a good point that streaming services really are uh, an opportunity for um, foreign language films or series in particular, I'm thinking of Squid Game, um, things that kind of become sensations. Um, and even something like, obviously not a foreign language film and only foreign because it's not in this country, but something like the Great British Bake Off, the, the baking show, that's a different culture uh, than the reality shows we see normally. Uh, so I think that it's funnily coming in television more so than it is in film, because you have people like Netflix who are uh, giving tons of money to these amazing filmmakers, and then tiny films will just be released on Netflix, like Prayers for the Stolen from Tatiana Hueso, which was the Mexican uh, submission to the Oscars this year, but they're doing, they do nothing for them. So I think that it's like, it's good and bad. There's a lot of money going around and sometimes that's good. Sometimes that means that a film gets made that's brilliant that no one sees. Good, thank you. So Ben, um, obviously film scene is a great uh, way to engage in a lot of different films and clearly uh, see see a curated listing and presentation of a variety of uh, international films as well as domestic films. Are there resources available that you could talk to us about in terms of if people are interested in specific um, types of films, you know, Latin American films or international films, or are there series, obviously you've referenced some future film festivals, um, but what's out there uh, available through film scene for people who may be interested in um, following up from this presentation and watching a few of the films uh, maybe that are being presented that are international? I think um, probably the easiest way is, is keeping up with our website at acfilmscene.org. And then um, the printed program we send out to members every month and also you can pick up at the cinema uh, every other month rather uh, in focus uh, to keep abreast of everything that's going on. And um, as far as dedicated international programs, um, I'm trying to think if we have any specifically international dedicated. I think that as it stands, uh, our programs aren't uh, country focused, uh, but they will be in the future. We'll have some of that. and it's rare that we're not showing a foreign language film at any given time. So there's probably something uh, that you can, you can see at film scene. And uh, I saw Carrie had a, you were raising your hand in, in the chat or in, rather in the Zoom window wanting to ask a question. I think you need to unmute yourself and still muted. Or maybe someone needs to unmute her. <laughs> yeah. Hey. <laughs> I screwed it up. Okay, but I think I, can I talk now? Yes. So this is a question more generally about films, um, although it came up specifically in terms of, let's say having a Bolivian play a Bolivian. Do you have to be, do you have to be a person with autism to play an autistic character? Do you have to be a schizophrenic to have experienced schizophrenia to play someone? 
I, I have trouble with that concept. And I just wonder if you could talk me through that a little bit. Is that too open-ended or do you, do you know what I'm trying to get to? Oh, no, no. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I know what you're getting at. And I think that it's a complicated question. It's um, obviously there's issues of representation within that, uh, especially when we're talking about, um, you know, neuroatypical people. That's a, that's a that's different kind of uh, presentation. But I think that in those cases, you're probably better off trying to work with someone who's actually experiencing those issues um, to represent it. Uh, I think that we've seen a lot of poor representations in the past of things like that. Uh, I'm thinking of I Am Sam right now with uh, uh, Sean Penn. And there's just, I think that's a more difficult Dorian line to cross. When we're talking about cultural representation, um, I do think that there's ways to make that work. Um, especially, I think, as I've mentioned a few times now, uh, getting accents and mannerisms and things down to specific people. Uh, but ultimately, if you can find opportunities for people within those subcultures or who have those specific uh, mental faculties, if you can make those things work, I, I think that's always a better option, personally. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm going to wrap this up, but I was wondering if you um, if you had any tips for any films that you think uh, our audience must see that might be coming coming down the pike at film scene. Okay, that's that's great. I, I'll highlight a few, and of course, we'll we'll stick with the international theme on the upcoming films. Uh, this Friday, the worst person in the world uh, is opening up. From director Joaquin Trier. This is his fifth film, I believe, uh, and also nominated for three Oscars um, about a woman who's trying to find herself pretty much in, in her early 30s. Um, but he's a director with a strong track record, um, a film that looks to be uh, upending the romantic comedy in a lot of ways, which happens to be one of my favorite genres, romantic comedy. Um, and Great Freedom is another film I'll highlight that's coming March 18th, so in a month. Um, and is a film about a historical figure um, who just after World War II uh, was put in jail for his sexuality, for crimes of homosexuality, so to speak, in Germany. Um, and he keeps getting put back in jail just for living his life every time he goes out. Um, but it's a very kind of heartbreaking and touching story. Um, and a smaller film, a film that was actually on the short list for the uh, foreign language Oscar, the international feature Oscar, um, and didn't make it to the final cut. Um, and speaking of films that didn't make it to the final cut from that list, um, compartment number six is a film from a Finnish filmmaker uh, that is actually about a Russian would-be kind of couple who meet on a train. And that opens March 25th and is reminiscent of the Before series, if you're familiar with the Before trilogy with uh, Ethan Hawke and uh, Julie Delpy. That's uh, two people meeting while traveling and kind of their tension and friendship and how the relationship develops over the course of the film. It's a very beautiful movie. Um, so I would highlight those three in terms of upcoming international films uh, that you should catch a film scene. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Ben. Um, and I will just say to everyone that we will now conclude our program and want to give a warm thank you to Ben. Uh, for his excellent presentation and for sharing his expertise and his experience with us today. Ben, I'm honored to virtually present you with an ICFRC mug, uh, which we will get delivered to you. Uh, it's highly coveted uh, by uh, the, those of us in the know in the mm -hmm. I, ICFRC, suitable for coffee, tea, or whatever's on tap at film scene. Um, ICFRC's program is on Friday, uh, 
our next program is on Friday, February 25th at 12 noon via Zoom. And this program will feature Dr. Kristen, Kirsten Kumpf-Bail and Dr. Waltraud Meyerhofer, who will talk about teaching Anne Frank, which is the focus of UI Provost Global Forum in early March. So thanks again to everybody and especially to Ben for joining us today. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you.